All right, I got nine o'clock straight up. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the regular meeting of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Um, thank you for coming today and a, another beautiful day in Colorado. Uh, we do have a quorum. We'll start with quick uh, introductions. Uh, my name is Norm Stein, Teller County Commissioner, and uh, your chair. Jill, you next. Jill Gabler, City of Colorado Springs. Ken Jaray, uh, City of Manitou Springs. Don Wilson, Town of Monument. Turner Smith, Trustee Rama. Colonel Brian Keel, I'm the Mission Support Group Commander at Shriver Air Force Base. And I'm Rob Bearden, I'm the uh, 10th Air Base Wing Vice Commander at the Air Force Academy. Good morning, Kirsten Aguilar, I'm the Mission Support Group Commander at Peterson Air Force Base. Welcome. Thank you. Jerry Storm, Military Affairs Council of the Chamber in EDC. Dick Ellsner, Park County Commissioner. Andy Gunning, PPACG. Mark Waller, El Paso County. And Neil Levy, Woodland Park. Yeah, good. Thank you, everybody. Um, our next item is the agenda approval. We have a motion to approve the agenda for today, please. Pump, mm -hmm. sir? So moved. Uh, <laughs> Mayor DeRay, second from? Sure, second. Commissioner, uh, Council Member Council. Uh, Gabler. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Approval unanimously. Public comments. Uh, you, we have item on uh, scheduled comments for U.S. Census Complete Count Committee efforts. And I think, Andy, you want to cover this one? Or someone else going to cover this? Uh, Jessica. Get <laughs> off. Very good. We have a guest speaker. So very, we are yes. very lucky. We have a guest speaker, uh, Maria Elena Rivera, who is going to come up and talk to us about the Census. Say hello. You're not on. Oh, you're not on. Good morning, everyone. And I, I'll try to raise my voice because I don't talk very loud. Can you hear me in the back? So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me here this morning. My name is Maria Elena Rivera. I'm a partnership specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau. I have several PowerPoints, but I'm going to whiz through them. My main purpose of being here today is put a name with uh, a face with the name, rather, and to let you know that we're beginning our efforts, uh, ramping up for the 2020 Census. Um, I understand you may have had some different partnership specialists in 2010 for those of you that were here. In addition to um, informing all of you that are here today, I just want to let you know that we're also working with uh, Sarah Johnson, the city clerk for this um, city of Colorado Springs, as well as with Jessica um, and Teller County. So our purpose is really to start uh, the movement to, com to create a complete count committee to ensure that all the um, uh, community members are included in your, in your census count. Um, that's our main goal. But there's a lot of work to take place between now and 2020. So why do we do the census? Um, one of the main reasons is it is mandated in the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, to ensure that everyone is counted. Um, the importance of it is tied to funding and also to draw congressional and state legislative uh, district lines as well as other, there's 16 other federal programs that are um, tied into the census count in addition to other nonprofit organizations um, and local government that utilize the data from the decennial census. And I'm going to whiz through these really quick because I know I have about 15 minutes. Um, in 2010, Colorado remained neutral in terms of apportionment uh, regarding legislative um, seats, but we are hopeful that with this decennial census that we will gain one. So that's another reason why we want to make sure that everyone is counted. And um, as I mentioned, there's 16 different... Uh, federal funding sources. I've provided the link here. I'm sure it'll be in your minutes so you can look at this as well. This is specific to Colorado and the breakdown basically is approximately for every individual that is not counted within your communities is approximately $1,500. That's $1,500 for every year over the 10 years. So if you think about approximately $15,000 for each individual that is not counted um, is potential funding that will not come to your community. So it's really high stakes. It, it does take a lot of work. 
But I'm um, confident that with the efforts of not only this council, but with the uh, community at large, eventually we will start working with the nonprofit organizations and more at the grassroots level. But at this point, we're really focusing on local government and in councils such as yours um, throughout the state of Colorado. Right now I'm working with um, the state of Colorado and Wyoming, but we are currently hiring an individual to work from Colorado Springs to support the Colorado Springs Complete Count Committee. And so that is open if you know anyone um, that may be interested in applying for that position. Um, a little bit of a difference this year compared to 2010. Now um, individuals will be able to either utilize the internet, call in and, and provide their responses, or complete the paper form. The census uh, will no longer be going to every single door. Um, it will be approximately 30% of the population will actually encounter a face-to-face. -face. We are um, in the process of really looking at ways that we can use other um, sources of data to fill in some of the uh, address canvassing gaps and to have a better list. And, and then um, in June, June, July of 2019, you will have an office opening, a census office opening here in Colorado Springs. And um, the staff members will oversee that process. Their first charge is to go with their electronic list and make sure there's a physical building uh, tied to that address, okay? Um, for those of you that are, are familiar with this process, I know many cities and, and counties have already submitted their address lists, the LUCA, and so we use that source of information as well. Um, individuals may or may not receive an actual survey. Um, the census will open up on March 23rd of 2019. Census day is April 1st. So our goal is to really utilize between March 23rd and April 1st and have as many individuals respond. They'll receive a postcard. They can, again, either go by internet, um, phone call, um, or they can uh, fill out, request a paper copy and have that sent to them. The timeline is a little bit small on your end. Um, we're a tad behind, um, but we are, as I said, ramping up to have the field staff in position. We are looking good, though, for the Census Office, as I mentioned, to open up in June, July of 2019. Um, the reason I'm here today is community partnership and engagement. And uh, just please, I, we need your help. The Census Bureau needs all of your help to spread the word about the importance. I was naive prior to taking this position and really understanding the importance of the census, um, the decennial census rather. I know there are other surveys that are sent throughout between the 10 years, um, some on a monthly basis, some uh, biannual basis, and there is a little bit confusion, but this particular one is the decennial census. So our goals, as I mentioned, are to motivate individuals to respond. I know there may be individuals in your community that um, are fearful of completing the uh, decennial census, and we're very aware of that. And we need support from trusted voices within the community to help um, demystify some of those fears. We also want to ensure respondents that the data is confidential and secure. Each census um, staff member takes an oath. We are faced with prison time and, and hefty fines, so we take this information very, very serious. We also, as I mentioned, just want to educate the general public about the importance of this. And I'm here today to mobilize um, support from the communities in this effort. Um, myself and the, uh, my predecessor will provide not only information and support, we also have um, specialists that are dedicated to tribes. So um, I understand there may be a large uh, Native American community within the Colorado Springs or El Paso County area. We do have dedicated staff members that will work specifically with tribal members in addition to your um, partnership specialists that will work with the general population. What we're asking, as I mentioned, from all of you is to help us identify those trusted voices to, um, for those of you that will be um, asked to participate in the Complete Count Committee, as I mentioned or, or I alluded to earlier, for this body, it will be an effort between 
um, the city of, El, of Colorado Springs, El Paso County, and Teller County at this point. And our two uh, liaisons right now are Jessica Mullen and Sarah Johnson. And um, in September 18th of this year, pardon me, Stan, thank you. Sorry, Stan, I didn't see you over there, <laughs> hiding in the corner. Um, on September 18th, uh, myself and a colleague will be providing that complete count committee um, a training on the structure of a complete count committee and, and starting that work plan. And again, I know 2020 sounds way down the road, but it moves fast. And sometimes government doesn't always move fast, so we want to be ahead of the game. This is a, um, a tool that's available on census.gov. Anyone has access to it. It's called the Response Outreach Area Mapper, or Rome. Rome will allow you to look at a track, um, census track level, um, which areas had a low response to the 2010 census, decennial census, rather. And those areas that are in the darker blue, greenish area, um, they had an excess of 30% or more uh, low response rate, meaning that approximately 30% or more of that community, that track, census tract, did not complete the census. And again, if you think back to the dollars that I, I referenced earlier, for every individual in that community that did a response, that's a huge chunk of money. Um, so you have access on, again, census.gov to look at this. I did just randomly pull out one of the darker census tracts. It does say El Paso County. In this particular area, it was 32.5 low response rate. I can't actually. Sorry. Can anyone else? I, I'm not as familiar. It's not at that level. It's um, yeah. Unfortunately. The way the maps are, if I were to try to drill that deeply in, I wouldn't be able to show um, the surrounding areas. Um, but I, I would be happy to work with you, Council Member. If I might, for Yolanda, this is uh, Stan Vandorf. It, it, the, the block that's on the screen is in the southeast area, so it would be one that would be of concern to you. So. Yeah, that was basically my question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yes. So um, the, when the census office is open, they will be in charge of leading those efforts. My understanding is for any individuals that physically remain on the base, there will be a separate process. For Not the base. The people who, who are in the military, but they off base. Right. That's, um, No, so that's what I was going to answer that. So those on the base will be counted separately. There's a separate process for that. Those that live outside of the base, they will go through the same process as anyone else, any other community member. Um, and the count is if you live in the city of Colorado Springs or in El Paso County on April 1st, then you're counted for that location. Does that make sense? And so one of the other things you want to consider, uh, you do have a few colleges and a university in this area. We really want to uh, make sure that those college students are counted before they potentially go back home in another state or another community. So those are other um, areas that we're going to look at. And in the complete count committee may end up having a subcommittee just for education, for example, just for military. And then those subcommittees will hash out their approach on and ensuring everyone is counted in those areas. You're welcome. And I think I'm running out of time. Um, I just want to share with you the state of Colorado, Governor Hickenlooper has um, signed an executive order and they are in the throes of um, finalizing their state count committee. Um, and it's a little, it's a higher level. So you have businesses, education, K through 12, higher education, faith-based media, community organizations, and um, it will not be um, chaired by 
Governor Hickenlooper, but he does have designees that are overseeing that process. And then here at the local level, um, you can see it expands a little bit more. So we have media, communication, business, community organizations, ex-offenders, faith-based, um, K through 12, homelessness, veterans, quarter groups, meaning for example, if individuals are living in um, nursing homes, uh, recruiting, immigration, and typically it's your highest level of elected official that will designate who will sit on that complete count committee. Okay? Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Again, every community is slightly different. So there may be some populations that are not identified in this graphic, but that does not mean that you cannot com um, com include them, invite them to the table to be a voice. So for example, one off the top of my head that's not listed is seniors. You know, possibly individuals that um, have a physical um, or cognitive disabilities. There's huge support groups and networks for that as well. So you want to think about who should be sitting at the table. There is a program called Statistics in School. <clears throat> and the purpose of this, I've provided the um, website link for that, is to encourage our young children. It's not considered a curriculum, but there are resources from K through 12 to start instilling the idea of um, the importance of the census and how can we use it in our math classes, for example. And so there's fun activities. And as we get f closer to 2020, we will start engaging more um, the K through 12 and higher education for sure and, and provide those resources to the educators. Media, another thing you want to consider, media and advertising. What are those um, community events that take place every year or may be new and will be taking place in 2019 that you can take advantage of several individuals in your community attending to get the word out. Unfortunately, my understanding is in 2010, um, the U.S. Census Bureau had lots of money and had lots of beautiful swag and I've been asked a lot about that and unfortunately that's not going to happen this year. There's been, as many of you have probably experienced, a lot of budget cuts. And so um, there will be um, some swag. They haven't identified it yet. And there will also be um, uh, press releases and other collateral materials that at your local level you can customize somewhat. And there will be some other canned um, types of collateral materials. So as that's developed, I will be sure to share this not only with all of you but with your complete count committee. This is an example. You can access this on census.gov and including anyone that's in the audience. It's census.gov forward slash partners forward slash toolkit. And it is a partners toolkit. And so it gives you some ideas on um, different ways that you can start engaging the conversation around the importance of the census, the decennial census with your community. Um, to my knowledge, as of right now, the information is not in any other language other than English. But we are looking to um, develop the materials in other languages as well. Next steps um, and what's ne critical steps and what's next. We are, as I mentioned, throughout the state. So our region, Denver region, is um, combined 12 different states. And so you have several partnership specialists in each state. And so we're all at different um, levels or different levels of our complete count committees that are established or that are, are new. So in some states we're a little bit more ahead of the game because the staff members have been on um, over a year and in my case and my colleagues with almost a month and a half. So uh, we're playing catch up but again our purpose is to meet individuals, put the name to the face, start speaking about the importance of the census. In 2019 we're going to continue establishing the community count committees as I mentioned, um, in Colorado Springs, the field office will open in June or July of 2019. The location, uh, to my knowledge, has not been finalized. There will be a few selected early um, census offices um, that will open up in April, March, April. And then at that point in 2019, the, co the complete count committee will begin their community organization mobilization process. In 2020, Early 2020, um, advertising campaigns, you'll start noticing advertising campaigns. 
We'll continue to support the community, uh, the complete count committee, the CCC's efforts, and encourage self-response. So as I mentioned, um, put in your calendars March 23rd, 2020. That's the first date individuals will be able to start self-responding. And we will have live data, so for your individual communities, you'll be able to see um, how well is your community responding and where do we need to shift our efforts. And our goal is really to have, um, we would love to have 100% by April 1st, but that's a little unrealistic. Um, but the process will continue at least through July of 2020 to follow up with those individuals that did not respond, okay? And I think I've, bless you, throughout my um, presentation, I probably didn't plead, but I'm pleading now for your help and support. And we just, again, want to ensure that every community um, is able to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I know dollars are tight, so this is one tool that all of you can, can uh, get behind and, and encourage your community. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, Dick Ellisner, Park County. Hi. Uh, you said El Paso County and Teller County. Do you have any idea who I need to contact? You can about contact Park me County? if you're in if you're interested in setting up one specifically for your community. Well, it's you know, I always feel left yeah. out. <laughs> Please don't. I'm I'm. That's why I'm here today because we, um, you know, in speaking to Andy and in speaking to Jessica and Stan, is Maria Elena. Why don't you come and speak to everyone? So. Uh, please don't feel excluded. Those were the individuals we'd already spoken to. Okay. My contact information is on this last slide. Um, as I mentioned, government did always move fast. I don't have a business card yet, um, but I'm also available by phone. That's and I'll give you the number, but they're going to change our phones. It's a uh, 972 area code 979-1429. But I will be your go-to person and um, at the point that we hire an individual for this area, then I'll make sure that they are aware of yours, your interest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy Littleton, El Paso County Hi. Commissioner. Um, at some point in time, I'd love to have you come speak and give a presentation to the Board of County Commissioners because then it's put on the TV loop and people can watch it over Great. and over. But it'll be at a time when uh, Commissioner Vanderwerf and our staff put together some kind of compelling reasons, you know, what do mm -hmm. we stand to lose as a county if we don't mm -hmm. participate. Um, I did have one question, though. Um, if people are filling out the census and there are questions that they don't feel comfortable or don't want to answer, they're not required to answer those, and their, their count will still be put in. They don't have Correct. to complete the entire census. Correct. I know the big question that um, is on everyone's mind right now is the citizenship question. That's still in litigation and has not been determined. Regardless of whether um, litigation is completed by the time April 1st comes around, the decennial census is still going to take place, with or without the question. Um, but that's, again, why I speak to, you know, what are those community um, populations within your community that may be fearful of answering certain questions, and who within that community can um, reassure them? And, and the reason I said earlier we take this data serious and the confidential of this data serious is because of the prison time and the hefty and the hefty fines. Mm -hmm. And um, the only information that is shared beyond the Census uh, Bureau, rather, is uh, aggregated data. So what are the critical things to know? Name, residence, I mean, just to there's have a count. There's 10 questions. Right now there's 10 questions. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? I'm running over, so any other questions? And pardon me? No. Ms. Randewerf? Uh, thank you. Hold on. Excuse me. Sir, sir, would you come up to the microphone? You're addressing the public, so thank you. Um, excuse me. My name is Bruce Fogarty. I was the vice chairman of the Complete Count Committee in 2010. We've written an after action report that talks about this whole thing. It's about a 60-page report would be given to uh, Maria and uh, uh, Sarah and to Jessica. So there's, we didn't have one when we started in 2010. J.D. Dallager was the chairman. Many of you know him, former superintendent of the Air Force Academy. But there is a going on at the same time of the census is the American Community Survey, which, does, which is like the long form. And that's going on all the time. And you don't want to mix the two up. 
So there is an ongoing effort, and a lot of these dollars are related to that survey. So it's very important to support that at the same time, not lose sight of that, but the effort is to get the, uh, the whole complete uh, census counted. Excuse me. Thanks for the correction. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vanderwerf. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I uh, appreciate your coming and giving the presentation. It's awesome. And I'd like to echo uh, Dick's uh, point. Uh, we should take this as an opportunity to start thinking about how to get a broader dissemination about what's going to happen. So, uh, you know, just thinking our way through that, we should get speaking opportunities and our, uh, all of our municipalities, you know, Manitou Springs, Fountain, uh, Palmer Lake, uh, Monument, uh, we really should get uh, both counties and all the municipalities completely ready and prepared as much as we can in advance of this happening so that when it comes to execution day, we have minimal issues. So thanks for coming here. You're and welcome. I think this board can do a lot to help us actually disseminate this further and and to have our communities be better prepared. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great yeah. day, everyone. Good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, and item uh, four is our consent items. We have five items in there. I'd like to pull three of those off for separate consideration. Uh, real briefly, item 4A is the minutes from last meeting. One quick uh, correction. Uh, item three of last week's, last month's minutes um, should read, uh, there, sh we're, there were two state legislators present at today's meeting, Representative Lois Landgraf and Representative Pete Lee. Uh, I'd like to make that uh, change. Um, so, so make the motion? Uh, if you'd like to make okay. the motion. I move to approve the minutes with those changes made by uh, Commissioner Steen. Steen, second. Commissioner Elsner, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, also, like to pull off item 4D. Uh, and for E together, and I'd like to have uh, uh, Mr. Gunning, and if you'd address those briefly, please. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and the applicants for those two projects are here as well in case you have questions that I can't answer. Uh, the sequence here was a little bit odd, so we didn't have a final uh, full report in, in your packet. Um, these are two applications for um, lift stations. They're reviewed based on our water quality management plan for the area. Uh, the first project for D was uh, at the Arrowhead um, Mobile Home Park, an application for a lift station and also to connect their service to the um, uh, Cherokee San Sanitation District. It was recommended for approval by the uh, Site Application Review Committee back in July, and then the Water Quality Management Committee just met yesterday on both of these applications. They did recommend approval of this uh, project as well. Um, the next step after board recommendation or board approval is that these goes, go to the state for final approval, final uh, permits. Um, the Water Quality Management Committee did recommend uh, with this project with the Arrowhead, Arrowhead um, Mobile Home Park uh, that it move forward with state approval and implementation as expeditiously as possible given the public health concerns in the area. So I would just suggest that that maybe be part of your motion for that one for 4D. Uh, 4E, Forest Lakes, um, it's an area southwest of the town of Monument. It's to add a lift, lift station for about 199 new single-family units, uh, also recommended for approval by both the Site Application Review Committee and the Water Quality Management Committee yesterday. Great. Thanks, Andy. So what we didn't have was the results of yesterday's Water Quality Management Board recommendation. We now have that verbally. Uh, is there a motion to approve uh, D? We'll take that one item at a time. Second. Motion by Mayor Levy and a second by Commissioner Littleton to approve item 4D and to expedite mm -hmm. uh, for, for state permit approval and implementation of the project as expeditiously as possible. Right, acceptable? Yes. Okay. Uh, all's in, okay. Any discussion on 4D? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Thank, thank you. Item 4E, uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Mayor Levy approves as our second. From uh, Turner Smith, uh, any further discussion on 4E? Uh, <laughs> all those in favor say aye, please. Aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you. I'll pass passes immediately, uh, unanimously. Thank you. Uh, back to consent items uh, for uh, B and C. Is there a motion to approve those remaining two items? Move to approve from Turner Smith. A second, Commissioner Littleton. Uh, all those in favor say aye. I oppose nay. Thank you very much. All right, on to uh, item five, uh, discussion items, PPACG strategic plan. Again, that's going to be Jessica McMullen giving a brief update and al along with uh, Jordan Moon. Great, thank you. 
Good morning, board members. I'm Jessica McMullen, your Policy and Communications Manager. Um, as you know, we've been working on the strategic plan. Um, this process began quite a while ago at this point, um, but we started really heavily moving in May when we did a strategic plan retreat. We did a debrief afterwards. All of our vision groups have been meeting. Um, and I'm going to have Jordan give you the rest of the update. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, Jordan Moon, uh, PPACG Strategic Plan Fellow. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, so where we wanted to do is just kind of give an update of where we currently are today, uh, some of the next steps and the timeline for completion. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, so the uh, after the strategic plan retreat, uh, I think there was five identified strategic priorities that the board came up with. Uh, and uh, around those, the vision groups were created. So we can report that um, within the last uh, couple months or so, all of those mission, vision groups have met. Um, so thank you to the board members for fitting us into your extremely busy schedules already uh, to, to, to be able to complete these. So there's a summary in your packets that should be for each of the, um, the vision groups, I believe. Um, just to give you an idea of just kind of what took place during those vision group meetings, uh, each of the board members participating in those vision groups uh, took a look at the initial language developed during the strategic plan retreat uh, and really codified the specific language they wanted to develop as, as the goal, uh, as one of the primary goals for the strategic plan. Um, also, amongst or once that goal was identified, um, from there, the discussion kind of went to how, it, how success would look like within the short and longer term and identified between two to four objectives uh, that would be clear marks of, of uh, success for that goal. Um, so again, um, from all the way, uh, all those vision groups have met and identified uh, a clear goal. The only note for just the, the board is that the collaboration, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the, the collaboration convening group kind of felt that that shouldn't stand alone as a, its own specific goal uh, and was rolled up into the information sharing as it felt more appropriate. Uh, that, that was more of an um, objective of the information sharing, not necessarily its own. So currently, distinct, we have four distinct goals that were uh, established through the vision groups. Um, the next step in the process for, um, for the board to, to know is that the, um, the staff at this point will take a look at all the objectives and, and goals that were, to, were, were established by the, the, the vision groups and come up with strategies into how to, com how to complete those objectives. Uh, currently, uh, the, advocacy, um, the advocacy group has completed that process, but what we should have in terms of timeline coming up is by the, the, the 17th of, of uh, August, we should have the remaining, um, remaining goals should have uh, objectives, or uh, correction, um, strategies completed for those. The next step after the, the staff has a chance to look at that, um, those will come back to the board or the, the individual vision groups where they can have a chance to approve what the staff has, has come up with for that. And again, we're looking hopefully about the 20th of August, I believe, is an opportunity for the vision groups to receive those back from, from staff. Um, that being said, going to the future timeline, um, we're hoping to have by the, by the next September board an initial draft uh, for your guys' review uh, to give an opportunity for the board to, to make um, comments or corrections from an initial draft. Um, after that process, the next step would be to have the, the different committees, uh, all the, the, the variety of committees have a look at that uh, once the board's approved it, and hopefully to have a final approval by the next, uh, the October um, board meeting. By committees, you mean the work, vision committees or the standing committees? The CAC, standing committees, the CAC, CAC, CAC the RAC, the, and all the uh -huh. variety of um, acts. So those mean. would be... No. Yes, <laughs> those will be added then to the uh, standing committee's agendas in September. Uh, okay, good. And then yes, and then um, hopefully by again the October um, board meeting you should have a a final or a, a draft for your final approval. Um, pending anyone's questions. Um, yes, Dan. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> you know, in uh, in building the strategic plan, you know. Uh, it's important to make sure we have something about how we get to the goals in the strategic plan. Otherwise, it's a document that you review and you like and you put on a shelf and you never actually use. So different people, you know, different public agencies do that in different ways. The way the El Paso County does that, we also have strategic planning and then we have periodic reports from the staff where they have specific actions that they have done to reach, um, to attain those goals. And sometimes those briefings are laborious and take a long time to get through, but it does help us see 
what the strategy is helps us continue to remind what those are, and then we get to actually see what are the actions that the public agency is taking to achieve those goals. So I'm hopeful you are thinking about including something like this in the strategic plan about how you intend on, a, on attaining these as well. Within okay. our implementation section of the strategic plan, we are specifying that we will at least twice a year give you a report back on where we are within all, each of the strategies to accomplish the objectives and how that is playing into the goal. Great. Uh, I, I'm, I appreciate that you have that. I consider that just as important as what the plan says itself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so when you meet, uh, are you going to have timelines set that by that meeting you'll have attained this goal at that point? Uh, what's that look like? Within each of the vision groups, we did ask as they were looking at their goals and objectives to really focus on a two-year-ish time frame. We don't have a solid, this is the drop dead date that this must be accomplished, but we want to be able to prove to the board as much as possible, this is what is done. Um, some of them may be completely accomplished within a two-year time frame. Some of them may have total progress forward. Some of them we may come back to you and ask you for help. Yeah, and with any strategic plan, obviously you have a division, but you also have resourcing that has to uh, line to accomplish those missions. So, as we develop budgets for this board, you may be consider whether or not a particular item, how, where it would fit in the funding. As you pick up a new, new programs, new uh, ideas, uh, that that uh, certainly it's an interactive process. I would say so. Yeah, and that's our hope. As Jordan mentioned, we hope to have a final product adopted in October. That's just in time for us to weave that in with our budget and our work program that starts in January. We're actually starting our budgeting process in the next few weeks, so it's it's good timing for this all to come together. That's the main implementation tool that we're going to use to implement stuff that comes out of the strategic plan is our work program and our budget. Just a couple things. Um, first, I, I really want to compliment Jordan and Jessica for this process. I have really enjoyed these the meetings we've had on this on the I don't know what are you calling them working groups, um, and how you've kind of guided uh, guide us and led us through the process. I thought it's been it's ha been handled really well. So just really thank you for, very much for that. And then I have a couple questions um, comments, and it's all in the um, area of transportation. And I wasn't in those groups, so of course I. Just want to kind of ask a couple things. Um, first, in the main on the main page, you have the goal, and and I guess I don't really understand it. It's um, build a comprehensive transportation plan for critical infrastructure, including and beyond 25. And and I guess I I'm, I'm confused by that because it's I 25. We, we're we're of course we're just reading in the paper that we have funding for the gap. Um, it seems like we have a MPO area that doesn't include most of that. So, and now you're you're saying beyond that, what what are we trying to focus on? I just want to understand that. So that committee actually did look at that language and decide to alter that goal language. That goal language ended up being develop and maintain a coordinated, validated plan for tra transportation needs across the PPACG region. Oh, I like that a lot better. And <laughs> that's why the committees are amazing. <laughs> and maybe even, I mean, not here in the goal level, but linking to, I mean, established plans. I know, John, you're, you're now itching. Um, okay. Um, the, ne <laughs> the next question, as it's, I'm in the group discussion area, um, you have the several, the key issues, um, I'll just read it. It says, several key issues were addressed during this period of developing new language for the goal, such as focusing on transportation needs in the East Pikes Peak region. And so I, I guess I'm concerned about that again. Um, I the East Pikes Peak region is important, but it's not part of the MPO, which is the area we plan for transportation and the very rural area. So, I, I mean, why are we focusing on an area that's not part of the MPO? <laughs> and, and again, I'm going to jump in and chime in on this. It was not that the group said that we needed that to be the focus of transportation, but that we needed to be acknowledging um, its role within our transportation infrastructure. I don't disagree, so but as, as Andy's talking about how this will feed into the budget, um, 
and we're focusing our transportation dollars on the MPO, that we don't fund projects outside the MPO, should we be if, focusing if, on if areas outside of our planning area? If I may. Um, yeah, part of the discussion about that was to focus on, you know, our MPO does include some of that area going out to the east, uh, you know. No. Uh, yes. I just, oh, I downloaded it today, it. and it goes maybe to Falcon, but it doesn't hit Calhan, it doesn't hit Raymond. I'm, I'm not arguing that. I'm, I'm agreeing. It goes okay. to Falcon. That's part of east, the east part of the area. Yeah. Now, the issue that we were trying to raise is that we do want to try to coordinate the funding and advocate for some of these other areas to make these kind of connections because 94 East, 24 East are part of our connection. It doesn't make much good to advocate for and get funding for a road that then stops at the edge of the border and you have nothing but dirt roads beyond. Okay. Uh, so that, that was kind of the issue and, and I get particularly that. looking at Shriver. I like that. Um, but So if that's the case, maybe it should be focusing on partnering with other MPOs to coordinate funding or something, but this this that was the intent. Okay, because that this gives the impression that we're going to be focusing our dollars on an area that doesn't represent yeah, that, us. There's, as you know, there's 15 planning regions in the state. We're okay. but one. The oh, one that surrounds us on three sides is a Central Front Range, yeah. TPR, uh, which has separate planning functions directly more of the CDOT. So I think that's maybe where you're heading. Okay. We are MPO number one. Tyler, Tyler just said that we are the most well, important. Well, we are listed as MPO one in, in the state. <laughs> of course, so. We're number one. That's right. Okay, that's really all okay. I had. I Thank you very much. And yeah. John, John, do you want to say something? You want to say something? Yeah. Well, I know you do. <laughs> I, I, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I learned a long time ago as staff, it doesn't matter if I want to say something or not, it's if you want me to say something. Uh, so that being said, I, I think, uh, again, it's uh, uh, the best way to put this is, there is uh, uh, kind of a division of the funds. There's the federal funds that when you pay your, uh, at the gas pump, you pay your uh, 18.4 cents a gallon that goes to, to the feds and it comes back. That is planned for and programmed through the MPO. Then you have your, uh, your state gas tax at 22 cents, and then you have your um, taxes and fees that go through Senate Bill 1 and 267. Those fall through another process, which is distributed through the TPRs. Now, the TPR number one has the same boundary as the MPO. So when it comes to federal dollars, we run that process. When it comes to that, those state dollars, we work with uh, CDOT and Wendy for, for those sorts of things. So the idea is, if I understand correctly, because again, I'm here to take direction uh, from the strategic plan, but I believe the, the, at the essence of this is, the state does a great job of planning the state routes and above. So when we're talking about something that's got a number on it, that's great, and how do we knit those together um, uh, within the region. Below that, however, we still have a tri-county area that needs connectivity, and how do we as the COG not necessarily as the MPO, but as the COG that has two TPRs, make sure that we're planning an, an effective, um, uh, seamless, multimodal transportation network. And I think that's sort of at the heart of it. And we're already sort of, as staff, trying to figure out how to come up with those uh, strategies that will meet that goal. And we've already been sort of talking to Wendy, shaking her down to see if we get some money to do uh, a, a, a sort of a tri-county uh, planning effort, because again, State does a great job at that higher level, state level. But again, if you're just traveling public, um, you want to be able to get around with transit and, and walking and bicycling and, and everything else. And we need to be able to stitch that all together. So. And if I could. Commissioner. And then, and then I've been promoted. Council member. I've been promoted. I've been promoted. No. That's not a promotion. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Council member Pico. Yeah, you know, I, I think he, he hit on a key point, which is that we're looking for a strategic plan for the Council of Governments that includes multiple TPR transportation planning agencies. So it's not just that we have our MPO, we also have a much broader view if we're talking about the strategic level of the PPACG. I, I completely understand that now. Thank you. Okay. I just want it to be understood in the document. And Trustee Sorry. Smith, do you have a comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, since the last time this board met, uh, there's been two uh, 
very serious uh, truck collisions out there on 24. Uh, and this is, uh, in one of them involved two fatalities. And so, uh, you know, the need is, to improve that road is, is there. Uh, we've known this. Uh, that's just in the last month. Uh, <clears throat> there were three fatalities on uh, Highway 94 uh, in the last month. So uh, I'm, I'm just bring this uh, to the board's attention. Well, and uh, so. And we've had 28 however, fatalities in the city of Colorado Springs in this in this year. In this what's that? We've had 28. Um, road fatalities in Colorado Springs this year, just just by comparison. So we're all feeling this. So uh, we just need to uh, solve this uh, one way or another. There's a lot of truck traffic out there. Um, I'm wondering if we might provide some clarity if we added a couple words to the to go here, develop and maintain a coordinated, validated plan for transportation, connectivity, and accessibility. And I wonder if there had been some discussion about that. We did discuss connectivity. Okay. So I just throw that out, assuming that maybe you had that discussion. Um, but Any other comments? Guidance for staff. Good. Thank you for the update. Move on then to item uh, 5B, Bravo, transportation performance measures. Mr. Ken Prather. Good morning, Ken Prather, PPACG Transportation Planner. Federal law requires that our long range plan and our transportation improvement programs or TIPS be performance based, and they've identified, the law identifies three areas that targets must be set for, and that's safety, infrastructure condition, and system performance. Um, the states must set their targets first, and then MPOs have, have to set their targets within six months following the, the state targets. Uh, CDOT last year, actually the October of 2017, uh, established the safety targets and PPACG adopted the state targets as ours, and we finished the, the formal process uh, last year. CDOT this year in May um, com uh, established its um, the. Uh, performance targets, it's, its targets for infrastructure condition and system performance. We have to establish ours by resolution uh, before November, by November 15th of this year. Uh, staff and Transportation Advisory Committee have been discussing this and talking about it, trying to determine do we adopt state targets, do we identify and create our own unique targets. Um, at this point, no formal recommendation is made, but both staff and, and the Transportation Advisory Committee are leaning towards adopting the, the, the state targets. Uh, we, the CDOT is working with all of the MPOs to develop kind of a standardized memorandum of agreement, um, uh, and hopefully that will be finished in the next month and so in a couple of months we'll be coming back to you with a recommendation um, for either ad adopting our own targets uh, or adopting the state targets and then approving those targets by resolution and approving a memorandum of understanding to, to sign based on whatever is the decision is made. Um, I, I will just say that the targets are, are we get to review them periodically. Safety targets are reviewed annually. The other targets that uh, are under consideration now are reviewed on a every two-year basis. So in two years, if we decide that we want to adopt our own, we could change and adopt our own at that point, continue with the CDOT targets, and the targets themselves can be reviewed and changed, whether it's ours or, or CDOT's. Mm. 
uh, real quick, the non like, how does how would these targets relate to our own scoring process, the prioritization, the thirteen criteria we established, and then how would it also would it relate to the strategic plan that we're putting up? How, how would the three programs uh, interact? Many of the topics that are identified here are, have been identified by staff and approved by the board to be used in our scoring criteria as we evaluate projects to be included in our long-range plan. The targets themselves are, are different because the federal targets weren't set, the state targets weren't set at the time that we adopted them. So the federal targets have to be reported to FHWA up through the state uh, and so there is a reporting procedure a monitoring procedure our scoring criteria we have we, we use the scoring criteria to select the projects we also have if you remember that the board did approve our vision our goals and our objectives and targets for those objectives for a long-range plan we can have separate targets in our plan, which you've already approved, um, that that are different or a different parameter of measurement. Um, but we still have to have the federal target, and we still must report on that that federal target. Now, as we move forward, now that the state has identified its targets and whatnot. Uh, we've already we're already scoring and evaluating projects that the deadline is, is is passed so it may not be something that's directly changed right now but certainly the next plan uh, and that we would start moving forward with soon uh, we could incorporate more it would, so they would fit better the the federal targets that we have now um, so they, they come along and uh, how your strategic plan sets the direction of where do we want to go with transportation and, and I think the targets would come along after that. I have a, I have a question. Okay. Okay. Great. Just a question on if the local uh, targets were more stringent and, and we missed them or we exceeded them, any impacts or the dollars flow to the, um, the aspirational targeting or anything like that? So what's the impact of the actual local targets? So it says in your memo that you can discern any, mm -hmm. any pros or cons of it, but I'm not so clear as to what the, um, what the impacts might or might not be for hitting or missing <laughs> or establishing higher or lower. The, the, the um, this is a learning process for everybody. This is the first time everybody is going through this. And it's been pointed out by FHWA that if we set a target higher than the state, say for bridge condition, well, the majority of the bridges, but, but, well, but no. if we set a target higher than the state, we can't direct the state what to do. We can't direct the state to spend money in El Paso County or Teller County to, to achieve our target. Because that's not the funding process. That's not the planning programming process. So there is a, a, a rub there, and it's, and it's recognized. Um, there, the federal law dictates some ramifications for the state if they fail to meet their targets, if they fail to set targets. Um, and most of it is on the failure to set targets. Um, but if somebody doesn't meet their targets, there is no fine, there is no loss of dollars, but it is something that the feds then would be reviewing very closely with the state. You know, is the target too aspirational? Is, is, is it can't be achieved, what, what happened, um, and that's a more of a direct impact to the state. The MPOs don't have that. 
but we get certified by this by FHWA every four years and that is something that uh, in our plans have to be approved and that goes up to FHWA for, for approval and so if we don't have the targets in there if we don't have reports on how we're trying to achieve the targets and I think that's what the emphasis is are you trying uh, as, as compared to just throwing something out kind of like was mentioned earlier you, you put something on paper and then ignore it so um, okay. there is no fine or all of your money has to go to this target and forget everything else until you meet your target because you failed Okay. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Littleton and then Wedderworth. Thank you. Ken, you talked about just a little bit about, you know, redefining um, metrics on how those things are measured. So, for example, we look at, and there isn't any one county in the Denver area that's over a million people, just like El Paso County. You know, if the, if the um, measurement is, does it have to be a contiguous county? Does it have to be a county that's contiguous that has a certain population? I mean, I don't see any reason at some point in time as Douglas County can, continues to grow, we don't include uh, Douglas County's population into El Paso counties as opposed to the Denver metro area. I know that sounds unusual, but when we look at, you know, measurements, um, you know, what happens in Douglas County when we, when we complete I-25, uh, I already see a lot of development happening in Douglas County along the I-25 corridor um, because they're counting on um, I-25 being completed into hopefully a four-lane uh, road because we're going to need it with the, uh, the developments even occurring yet, not even considering what's in the queue up in Douglas County. So if we could realign some of those measurements like you talked about and have Douglas County count towards our population, we are well over a million and should be able to have, I think, a significant more impact than we currently have. Well, you raise a, a, a couple of issues. Denver, the, the federal pr performance law requires MPOs. Right now, Douglas County is not in our MPO, so we wouldn't include it. Um, they were unhappy with Dr. Cog many, many years ago and reached out to PPACG to, to see about becoming a member of PPACG. We'll have to start recruiting that again. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, a, that's an entirely separate process to redefine MPO and, and COG boundaries, and, and I won't go into there, that today. Um, the, the MPOs with a population of a million or more have additional requirements that we do not have. And so um, in your, the uh, CMAC traffic congestion uh, targets of annual hours of peak, peak uh, annual hours of peak hour of excessive delay and percent of non-single occupancy vehicle. Those are requirements only for Denver. They do not apply for us at this time. Now, in I think it's two or four years, we will be required to adopt those. But at that point, we will be uh, an attainment area and we won't have any CMAC requirements. And for the same for the CMAC air quality, um, volatile organics, particulate matters, carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxides, we have to report now because we have CMAC projects, but the next time that this gets reviewed in two years, if we're on schedule, that will not be a requirement for us because we will no longer have any CMAC projects. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, this is great. Um, I'm a real strong believer in performance-based metrics for dealing with systems performance, and that's what these highways are in Colorado. It's a big, giant system. Uh, I am interested in perhaps a follow-on meeting to make sure I understand what in the world these requirements are. Uh, I also uh, honed in on that annual hours of peak hour of excessive delay per capita, not realizing that it was Denver only or Denver-centric, I took 5.6 million citizens in Colorado at 48 hours of lost time per citizen. That came to 268 million lost hours of productivity, which is the equivalent of 134,000 citizens' complete total loss of their productivity in Colorado. So um, why I bring that up is I feel that delays on the highway are a gigantic economic development and human productivity issue. Um, now, that's only Denver, so the number would be smaller, right? Uh, but, but nonetheless, I, I'm interested in really truly understanding what these numbers are. I'll come down to nitrous oxide, and again, maybe I don't understand what the numbers are. First of all, 420.038, 420 of what? 
is my first question, but let's say it's um, parts per million. I don't know what it is. Uh, going to the two-year target standard, going from 420 to 86, that's an 80 percent reduction. You know, it might be a practical impossibility to do that in two years. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what those numbers are, but maybe you've got to go to 50 percent electric vehicles to do that in two years, and it isn't realistic. So the reason why I'm bringing this all up is I don't really know what these numbers truly mean. And we don't necessarily have to go through a detailed description of that in this board unless the board is interested in it. But I can tell you I'm personally interested in it. So I'd like a follow-on meeting so I can understand what these are. Having said all that, I do have some concerns about the numbers, but maybe if I better understand them, I won't have those concerns. Sure. And, and just for clarification, the, the CMAC air quality organic compounds, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, nitrous oxides, those numbers are kilograms per day. And this is benefits of the CMAC program, the CMAC projects. So they're looking forward two years from now. The projects that they have today will have been completed. We won't have new ones. So the numbers are lower in the future because at this point, that's the known, this is based on the known existing CMAC projects. So two years from now, those that are operating today will have been finished, completed. And so that's the way this is, is set up. We have a benefit of uh, right now, based on our existing um, projects, we're, we're saving, our projects are saving 125 kilograms per day of carbon monoxide. When those projects are completed and we're no longer reporting on them, they'll that, that that's why it would be zero out in the future if, if we were to continue to do that. Yeah. On the uh, peak hours of excessive delay, you know, you go from 48 to 52 to 54. I'm assuming you're intending on designing highways to reduce delay times. Uh, that's kind of why we expand highways, for example, but those numbers are actually going up. So there could be another component of how you're obtaining those numbers, which is about increased population, which then is contributing over and above what you're achieving on the highways. The achievement of highway expansion is to reduce that number, I would assume, but then population growth is still growing the number anyway. So this is the kind of conversation I need to have on these requirements. Otherwise, I'm going to have a hard time voting for um, adopting them, at least for my vote, right, at this board. If I don't understand what they are, you know, I'm going to have a hard time doing that. Excellent. And I can meet with you. The uh, federal law identifies the formula that has to be used to to calculate these percentages and, uh -huh. and these these targets. And whether you meet or fail your your target, that's all identified in detail by the federal law. And so that can come back to you, or in a separate workshop, or individually, uh, however you would like. Uh, to do that. I'll just leave it at I personally would like a meeting, but then there may be other board members that may want to be in that meeting as well. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> I got a lot of the same questions and, and concerns in there. As, as I was looking at these numbers, they really didn't seem to make any sense to me. Um, I, I, you helped a little bit by saying that these are the current conditions are based on Denver, do I understand? Just those the two rows that, that apply to Denver, the rest are statewide targets, and, and, and it, it does look funny. You take, take the first one, uh, interstate in good condition. Well, Current condition is 45 percent. Yeah, two years, CDOT wants to be at 46 percent statewide. Four years, be at 47 percent. They're not aspirational goals, and they figure with calculating in deterioration within the same time period, additional growth, wear and tear, at the same time, how much money do they have to, to put into repairs? Well, yeah. It's not a large growth. And at the same token, and this is where it takes a little bit of study, percent in poor condition, currently a quarter of a percent, the goal in two years and in four years is 1%. Yeah, we, so we want to increase the poor condition by uh, times four, if I read this right, and that's where I'm going. I'm not understanding that. And that goes down percentage of pavement in a non-interstate in poor condition. We want to increase that to two percent from one percent. I'm not. I'm not tracking as to what these metrics are supposed to be measuring on the air quality. I want to zero back on that. 
I know here, we've had the report here um, that El Paso County is in attainment on all these measures, as most counties apparently are not. And we apparently want to, for example, increase the particulate matter by a factor of three. I, I, I don't understand why that is written the way it is, and, and I kind of like this follow one to make yeah. make sure we understand what it is that we're, sure. we're trying to set because it it seems counterproductive to me, and I'm, it doesn't doesn't track. Okay. It sounds like at least two. <laughs> so, so let's uh, talk at about at least one work session. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll we'll take that up in a work session in the future, yeah. and maybe if you obviously we'll notify people where, when it's on the agenda, that'd be helpful. Mm -hmm. Good. Anything else for uh, Mr. Pray there on the uh, transportation performance measures? This is just an information item, so yep, looking for, for the questions you have. Very good. Thank you. Uh, information items, um, this is an obligation, a federal report, uh, project rather, 6A. Mr. Lesados. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the uh, board, um, this is an information item just to keep you in the loop. Um, as we've already discussed today, as you know, uh, within the, uh, the, the COG boundary, we have the MPO boundary. Within that MPO boundary, we receive federal funds. The, um, maybe this is an oversimplification, but federal funds basically has to be spent in the year that they show up in the first year of the TIP. That's not because of the apportionment. You get apportionment, which is good for the year that the feds give it to you, plus three more. But to use that apportionment, you need what's called obligation authority. And the obligation authority, though there are a few exceptions, um, is good only for one year. So basically, you've got your, your blue money, and you've got your yellow money, and you have to have them both at the same time to have your green money. And so we've had uh, some issues in the past with uh, making sure that we've delivered uh, the projects. Um, and uh, CDOT has been a great partner in spending the money for us someplace else in the state and then returning it the next fiscal year. So again, if we couldn't use our, our uh, only one year money, they would spend it someplace else and then they would give it back to us. Well, that number now has gotten up to about uh, 25 million. And uh, the, uh, the new federal a act um, has also put some other caveats on things. So basically, CDOT's no longer going to be a position to help us out anymore after uh, 2020. Bless you. Uh, after about 2020. So we have identified about, uh, again, the $25 million worth of projects that need to uh, be obligated uh, by 2020. We've reached out to the uh, jurisdictions of which this impacts. Uh, those jurisdictions have been great in, in stepping up and saying, yes, we understand what the issue is, and yes, we understand that uh, if we can't deliver the project, um, we'll go ahead and cancel the project and uh, uh, get the money spent so we don't want to lose any money to the region, and then we'll regroup and bring that project back again at a later time. Uh, so again, while it would be canceled now, uh, there's no uh, nothing that's keeping that project from coming back in the future. So the reason for this information item is to let you know that uh, your staffs, at least the ones of you that are within the NPO, uh, are working on uh, this issue, and if they come to you and say, hey, uh, we've, got we've got one of those projects, I need uh, X or Y, or I, we need to make sure we have the, um, uh, the match money available. Uh, this way, you're, you're part of the solution uh, by being uh, uh, informed. And so again, uh, your staff is doing a great job, and I want to make sure that I let you know what's going on so that you can support your staff uh, to sort of clean up this uh, uh, glut of projects. In the future, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll come back to you with some policies and procedures uh, that can kind of clean up uh, some of the issues that may have caused this in the first place so that we will uh, in the future only have projects uh, that again get obligated in the first year of, of the TIP and if they're not ready uh, we'll have some backup contingencies. Uh, there are other things that you can uh, uh, use uh, federal dollars for that would uh, uh, be something that you could obligate very quickly, for example, uh, transit projects, that sort of thing. And again, that's just an information item, uh, but I'm happy to try to answer any questions or deflect them to Wendy. <laughs> Turner. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, if I understand the question correctly, you mean if somebody returns the funds? Yeah. If, some, if, if someone returns the funds, uh, going through our process, we will then notify all of the jurisdictions, again, 
just the jurisdictions within the MPO, that the, the funds are available. And then they would then come back and make application for those funds, notice the funding availability is basically what we would do. And then the committee as a whole would then decide where to do it. I believe there's an existing policy, I haven't memorized everything yet, uh, that uh, the first intent or the first priority would be go to projects that are already in the plan but are short of funding to make sure that they are fully funded and they could get ready to go. And again, that makes sense, making sure that, again, we're not creating another problem where something doesn't um, end up being a problem. Was it something I said? <laughs> Do you need help? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't blame them. My kids walk out of the room when I'm talking too. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, the question on a, uh, per, how the, you got into this situation is it because projects have not been able to been brought to construction, or is it because of unspent contingencies, or what? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, Wendy, feel free to hop up and correct me if I'm wrong because it, it happened before I got here. But I think a majority of it is just a, 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 the projects, actual construction projects, and again, navigating the federal process. And I think it, at uh, at uh, some point, uh, there were folks that were like, hey, yeah, well, this is money. Let's just go and get it. And they didn't understand what they were sort of signing up for. Um, I find a majority of the issues has nothing to do with the staff that I'm dealing with now. It was a lot of, there's been a lot of turnover in the region, apparently. Um, and one gentleman didn't even know he had a project, uh, let alone that it, it needed to hurry up and get uh, done in the next two years. So is there any case where a match, for example, is not provided and the project, I mean, uh, it'd be nice, we could go through each of each, but yeah. we're not going to do that, I yeah. here, but. But Mr. Chair, members may you know, uh, to my knowledge, there was not any, uh, any issue with any match uh, not coming uh, to bear when needed. Okay. Uh, but that being said, Again, we're going to have this short time frame for these projects that, that are coming forward now. That's why I mentioned match, because I don't want to get to everything's ready on an engineering level. Every, right. All the funds are already on a regional level. Uh, but then when the, the, you as a commissioner or a council member basis, are saying, oh, by the way, we're, we're going to need a, you know, 18%. we're going to need that 18% now, uh, then all of a sudden uh, it's a surprise. And yeah. again, the way we can make sure that we avoid the situation again is making sure everyone's well informed and there are no surprises and we are know what's going on so Good. okay thank you very much any other questions all right we'll then move on to uh, military installation reports um, and welcome to our new members it's a uh, honor and pleasure to have you here uh, the uh, although you're not morning members we see our mission as supporting our military partners as a major part of what we do so um, uh, Colonel Amberwire maybe you can start us off Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, on behalf of Colonel Todd Moore, the 21st Space Wing Commander at Peterson, thank you very much for having me here today. As mentioned in introductions, uh, Colonel Kirsten Aguilar, new Mission Support Group Commander over at Peterson. Many of you probably worked with my predecessor, Colonel Tim Ryan. Uh, he and his family have moved on to Germany, and my family arrived about six weeks ago. Um, new first time in Colorado Springs. Uh, just feedback as my family has been getting settled, getting my kids ready to start um, public schools tomorrow. We're very impressed with the uh, support. Uh, not a lot of cities benefit from strong cooperation with the uh, military and the community. So just as a new resident, just wanted to pass on some feedback. Thank you very much. I've got three updates for you this morning, and then I have one request for support. Um, <clears throat> First, we continue, the, the base Peterson continues to work with the Colorado Department of Public Health um, and the environment on the PFOS, PFOA. So I've got an update for you on some of the ongoing efforts. And so we've been working closely with the airport, and our expanded site investigation um, continues. It's in progress. We received approval from the airport to start our well um, installation, and that began on the 31st of July. We anticipate the field work to be completed by the end of September, but don't anticipate receiving the final expanded site inspection report um, until May of 19, and that will be publicly released by the Air Force Civil Engineering Center. Um, but so far, we've um, seen positive results um, in our mitigation efforts, especially as we work through the overflow on the airport. Um, the second item is the ongoing FedEx project outside of our main gate, the West Gate um, Airport in Stewart. Uh, we've worked really closely with the contractor. Um, they're doing some work to lay some underground piping, and so we've worked to allow them access um, close to the gate 
And uh, they've agreed to do that work primarily on the weekends to mitigate the impact to the traffic, which we are appreciative of. Um, and the final thing is an update on our Northgate security um, advancements. And so due to some force protection issues and some anti-terrorism um, requirements, we've had to close uh, the north gate, which we know has impacted the communities just on the outside of the gate. And so right now our north gate is only open for inbound traffic from 06 to 0900. Um, we've worked some mitigation strategies, um, and we anticipate reopening the north gate. Um, inbound traffic will remain from 06 to 09, but we will have outbound traffic uh, continuously from uh, 06 uh, to 1800, so 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and pedestrian traffic will be able to uh, continue, which we know will allow um, folks <coughs> to continue to patronize the, uh, the areas outside of the gate uh, that have been recently impacted with us having to close the north gate for security reasons. And then the one area that we are looking for um, some support it's aligned with some of the things you've discussed this morning regarding traffic safety um, in the city and the county. And so just recently, in the last two days alone, we've experienced two um, vehicle accidents outside of the East Gate on Mark Shuffle. And our leadership is concerned, especially as we look to see the advancement and the development across on the east side of Mark Shuffle in some of those planned developments, um, that we would ask for your support to to review safety and accident data, um, potentially consider surveying whether or not at some point based on that development um, and the traffic flow and the speed that is there a need to install an actual traffic light at the intersection of the East Gate and Mark Shuffle. So we had to close the East Gate for the last two days just to mitigate um, the impact to the accidents. Fortunately, uh, neither accidents suffered any fatalities or major injuries. Um, and part of that we attribute to the collaboration between our first responders on base um, and the Colorado Springs Police Department and El Paso County Sheriff's. So pending any questions, that's all I have for you. Is that the intersection in the city or outside of city limits? I, it is. Okay. I, actually, I, I don't know the answer to that okay. question. It's, it's in the city. Go, go okay. ahead. District. Yeah. <laughs> Where should we go? <laughs> Not just in the city. Yeah, I, I'm, did you have that gate closed for two days? So we closed it just um, for about 30 minutes at the end of oh, the day yesterday, minutes, yeah, and then about, um, I want to say it was about the same the day before, because the vehicle accidents occurred um, at, the, at the end of the day during typical rush hour. Yeah, I think I saw one of those, but uh, going, going in and out there. But yeah, that is in the city, and, and um, putting a signal light there is something we can take a look at. Okay, we appreciate that. Thank Thanks. you. Very good. Okay, um, Colonel Braden, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, Rob Bearden uh, recently arrived here from uh, Newport, Rhode Island, replaced Pat Carley, who many of you uh, have worked with over the last couple of years. And on behalf of Colonel Campbell, the uh, 10th Air Baseman Commander, and General Severia, our uh, Air Force Academy Superintendent, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Um, only a couple, one thing really to pass on uh, via information-wise, uh, coming up Labor Day weekend is our, our Parents' Day weekend. So. We, uh, cadets are back, and we're going about to have an influx of people over Parents' Day weekend. Uh, so that is the 31st of August through the 2nd of September. Uh, so we'll see an influx of people. Uh, we don't expect any delays or uh, problems, but we'll see an increase of uh, usage in local hotels and restaurants, that kind of thing. Um, also that weekend will be uh, our first football game. So uh, playing uh, Stony Brook, and we'll get things kicked off for the season. So uh, pending any questions, again, it's my pleasure to be with you. Thanks. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, Colonel Kell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. So Colonel Brian Keel from yeah. Shriver Air Force Base. On behalf of Colonel Jennifer Grant, the commander of the 50th Space Wing out at Shriver, thank you for the opportunity to, to just share a few things. Um, the first of all is we appreciate the community support, both at the state level and also the county and the city with some of the discussions we've recently had over the last several months on Highway 94. And as I heard here, that's also a concern for, for this body as well, too. And, and we truly appreciate that with the expanding mission we have for space operations out at Shriver Air Force Base. That's 
that's on the forefront of, of the leadership's concerns about making sure that we have a safe travel for folks going back and forth from Peterson to Shriver, but also from their local community homes and the places they patronize out to Shriver Air Force Base. And then also for those who live out there, we have 242 homes uh, on Shriver Air Force Base, about 800 residents total in those homes who spend a significant amount of their time going into Colorado Springs for both shopping, school, entertainment, et cetera. And so we appreciate the discussion that the Colorado Department of Transportation has had with us, the county, to take some look at, at what we can do to make 94, as you mentioned, sir, uh, you know, a safer place, less fatalities, and be able to handle the capacity as well, too, of the folks that, that live out there. And in fact, CDOT was able to do a study uh, of traffic patterns and traffic uh, capacity and, and really found the same things we found in a study we did uh, late last year at our gates and found a similar number of vehicles are going down that that section. And we also appreciate the county's help, too, as we look at the 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 spurs that come off, if you will, 94 and go into the two gates that we keep open because that will help with the traffic and the, and the expansion that's going out there. So thank you for that support and we continue to look forward to working with both the state and the county on that. And then second, just as more of an informational item, so the USO has a, has a very large presence at Fort Carson and it does a lot of things for the soldiers out there. We've been just recently able to partner with the USO at Shriver and once a month now they're coming out and doing a First Friday event uh, at an event center that we've recently completed about a year ago. And it's an opportunity to allow our families and our airmen to get together at the end of the day on a Friday to enjoy some camaraderie um, and to enjoy some complimentary food and, and drink. And the reason I mention that is the local businesses here in Colorado Springs are the ones that are providing that food and drink to our airmen. And so we've had a very successful two events now, one in, the, in July, right after the 4th of July weekend, and then one the first weekend here in August, or the Friday of, first Friday in August. And we've had several hundred of our folks come out and bring their family members. Mm -hmm. It is a 24-7 mission out at Shriver Air Force Base because satellites like to be talked to all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to have the opportunity to leave the mission for an hour or two to listen to a band, uh, a local band, uh, and to have some free food provided by the local businesses through the USO has been very beneficial to the, the morale and welfare of our individuals out there. So we appreciate the community support with that, and we look forward to continue doing that over the next several months as we get into the to the fall season. Great. Any, any, and, uh, and just like to echo, actually, uh, Colonel Aguilar, too, uh, I've been all over the Air Force. My dad served for 24 years. I'm hitting my 24 year uh, mm -hmm. later this, at the 1st of September. I've been in a lot of places, and the, the support that Colorado Springs provides to the military is greatly appreciated and commented often by our young folks. So thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Littleton. Thank you. I want to thank you guys what you do, for what you do. Um, I had the opportunity about a week and a half ago to have breakfast with General uh, um, Hyten and his wife, Laura, while I was out in Nebraska. And I pushed for Space, space Command for you guys. <laughs> so just wanted to let you know that. It kind of sounds like it's going to land up in D.C. in the Pentagon somewhere. Um, I don't know who, who they'll displace out there. But I was trying to, I was trying to get us there for uh, having Space Command out here with Schreiber. <laughs> The Space Force, yes. Space Force, right. Okay, very good. Thank you uh, again. Um, we have no mobility coordinating committee report today. We'll move on to transportation advisory. Uh, Mr. Brian Vitulli. Good morning. Brian Vitulli, City of Colorado Springs, Mountain Metro Transit, and Chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, the report is in your packet. And we had a fairly short meeting, but... Um, we will be back at it this month, but if you have any questions, I can answer those. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, community Advisory Committee. Dick Moore. Pretty much what he said. You have, uh, <laughs> you have our uh, report in your packet. Uh, one thing I would spotlight is that um, we were briefed on uh, changes to uh, the plan, um, let's see, it was the uh, flexible funding policy, and we voted to table that because uh, what we had received before the meeting uh, was modified following attack input, and we were unable to arrive at a consensus on, uh, on whether we thought the whole thing should be forwarded or approved part of it. So at this point, uh, we're going to be looking at it again this, this month. Very good. And just to remind her, the, as we move forward, this board moves forward the strategic plan, you'll uh, look forward to your comments on how we're doing on setting our objectives for the organization. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Something to look forward to. Yes, good. And if there are there any other questions. Yep. Saying none, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Regional Advisory Council, I think uh, Jorben has an update, maybe, a report. 
Uh, Joe Urban, Area Agency on Aging. Dave was not able to be here today. Um, I, I think you folks have the report. I have one correction that, that slid by us. Um, mentions Jody Barker being appointed as the chair of the Colorado Springs Commission on Aging. He was actually appointed chair of the Colorado Commission on Aging. So, small difference. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Saying none, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. All right, uh, Water Quality Management Committee, I think we've already had a brief report. Uh, Andy, anything else? Yeah, just to amplify a little bit, there was a Water Quality Management Committee meeting yesterday. It was a little bit dormant for about a year or so, but we're getting the band back together. And the, the main thing we're doing um, w with the committee, they reviewed those two site applications I mentioned earlier, but they're also now diving into an update to the area-wide water quality management plan. It's also known as the 208 plan, which is 208 of the Federal Clean Water Act. Um, and I want to make sure that we engage with everybody that should be at the table. It's a, it's a region-wide plan, somewhat similar to our transportation plan, but maybe not as detailed. Last one was adopted in 2010, and given the changes that we've seen throughout the region as far as population and uh, population growth and development, it really is ready for an update. The main focus is to look at water quality issues, not water supply. So it looks at all the basins that we have, all the different uh, river valleys throughout our three-county region, looks at wastewater provision, and anybody that's kind of adding pollutants or if there's a pollutant of concern in different parts of the region, they're addressed in the, the management plan, uh, which is then used as guidance for any new wastewater treatment plants, expansion of a plant, new lift stations, other improvements like that to the wastewater system. They all go through the review process to make sure they're consistent with this plan update. So I'll be reaching out to um, a handful of the jurisdictions to make sure that we've got full representation um, at that committee as we go through this update process. We hired a consulting firm, um, Brown and Caldwell, to help coordinate this effort um, in really good hands with um, their technical expertise. Uh, so we're going to be doing this over the next year. You'll see a draft of this, hopefully um, middle of next year. Then this has to go to the state for final acceptance um, by the Department of Public Health and the Environment. Um, so just wanted to let you know that that's underway now. Good. Thank you. Any questions for, yes, Sharon? It, it will be. But, so, yeah, the question as to whether PFAS will be addressed in the plan um, was not addressed in the 2010, the current version, but it will be in the update for sure. That came up in a conversation yesterday. Uh, it's one of our new pollutants of concern, along with others, so they'll, be, um, they'll all be addressed in the plan. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, move on to CDOT, monthly update. Uh, Karen, you got this one? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'll answer any questions uh, this group may have. I know the biggest impact that has recently come is we had a culvert, kind of historic culvert. It's like a rock culvert on the walls and then has a concrete top to it. But um, it's on Manitou Avenue, US 24 business route. Uh, it's Ruxton Creek. It leads to Fountain Creek, and it runs parallel to Ruxton Avenue, right? And um, so we are going under emergency repair, we have gotten transportation contingency uh, fund approval in the amount of about $1.5 million to $2 million. And so we've sent uh, an abbreviated version of um, bid plans to four contractors um, yesterday or Monday, and we will get the bids um, either tomorrow or Friday, I think Friday, and then they will be allowed to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know if they will. And we set a completion date of September 21st, I think. Yeah, September 21st um, to get that repaired. So that portion of the highway is shut down and, and just get in there and get out to repair it quickly. So that's called an emergency project. That's a real quick process that we were able to do pretty successfully. So I want to say, you know, my team did a good job. They worked late and weekends to get those that project out to bid. Um, so that's the, the major thing. We, we think it may be related to the July 23rd flood, but we're not sure. So we may also try to get reimbursed for those transportation contingency funds through, um, uh, you know, uh, um, federal emergency repair or state emergency repair. Um, the This is kind of CDOT, not CDOT, but it looks like there's two ballot measures that'll be in November election, I don't know. I wasn't here earlier. Did you guys talk about that? The, so, so the two, and we'll we'll explain more. 
probably next time or in future meetings, but there's the Fix Our Roads one, which is uh, has submitted signatures, and then uh, the sales tax increase, 0.62 cents uh, or percent uh, uh, transportation increase. So we've been working with the group that has the 0.62 percent sales tax increase on identifying ballot measure projects. We have not been working with the Caldera or Independence group on the other transportation. So if there's other projects listed on that, CDOT's not been involved. So we're, we're looking to how would we get involved in that. So right now, they both groups have submitted signatures. That was Monday, and then we'll find out in the next week or two whether they both are validated in terms of their signatures and move forward. And then we'll talk about the differences between them. Again, CDOT's neutral on them, but we'll just at least state here's, here's the differences between the two um, ballot measures from a transportation standpoint. But also, I don't know how much this group will get involved in that, but we'll probably be given information uh, from our headquarters that will help us identify the differences in the um, projects. So we do have a ballot measure list of projects that would be on the 0.62% sales tax increase. I want to commend CDOT. We had our first closure of uh, US 24 uh, Butte Pass for, for flooding. Oh, yeah. We had, uh, I think, a really timely closure, but then even more importantly, timely reopening. Uh, Good. Thank you for notification. It was, uh, I, I think, everything I've heard was uh, was well received. So thanks for, for having that process ready to go. Uh, other questions for uh, Karen Rowe, Director? I would just echo that as well and commend your staff for the quick response and uh, getting the road back open again. I think that that's uh, extraordinary to do that. It's it's a tremendous issue to see that float and see the, see how much material is getting moved. It's unreal. Yeah. yeah. Commissioner? Thanks. Um, have you reached out to Caldera or reached out and just not been responded to so that you guys I don't. I don't know. Our government relations is working on that, and our Transportation Commission is trying to decide how to how to coordinate with them or how to reach with them. I don't. I don't think they've reached. I know they haven't reached out to us, but um, I don't know whether we have tried to reach out to them. Again, from our standpoint, it's not our initiative, and until we know that they got signatures for it, um, you know, we didn't know how much effort we wanted to put forth. So they're working on a strategy of how do we coordinate with them? How do we get input on that? Mr. Waller, or I'm sorry, Wetterworth. Pardon me. Do never make that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw a hand go up in this end of the table. Commissioner Vanderwerf. Pardon me. <laughs> I'm sure Commissioner Waller doesn't want to be called Commissioner Vanderwerf. Oh, no, no, Commissioner Vanderwerf doesn't want to be called these Commissioner These guys really Waller, are friends, whether it looks like or not. <laughs> For the, I, I do have a you question call, about You the, could call them council. <laughs> the, two, uh, the two ballot measures. I know that they... And this is just a, perhaps a matter of up, um, my being updated on this. I know both of them had been submitted um, in time to the Secretary of State, but also that the signatures need to be validated. Mm -hmm. Has that been? Have they both been certified by the Secretary no. of State? No, that's what I was saying. In a week or two, that would happen. So okay. that's where we didn't put forth a, much, a big effort on comparing the two until we knew. Yeah whether yeah. one, both, or neither were on there. So I think moving forward, you'll see more of that information. And like I said, we're trying to strategize as to how do we coordinate or do they even want us to coordinate with the other, the Caldera measure. Sure. Yeah, they both did submit signatures, and I think they're both going to be validated. They were way over the, both were way over the limit. So I think we get there. The, the big differences between the two are, one uses a lot of general fund money and some bonding, and the other increases taxes. Well, but there's the one that increases taxes has money that goes to local. The other one doesn't. Sure. sure. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other, any other comments? Karen, thank you. Thank you for your report. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, right, uh, Stack, uh, I was not able to attend. I was traveling. Uh, Andy, could you give us a report there, please? I was on vacation last week as well, but our, our loaned uh, member, John Leo Sados, was there. Raises uh, one point where I probably need authorization from the board, or if you're okay with this, I'll just do it. But I need to send a letter to CDOT to have John listed as a, um, an alternative. He was sitting there by himself. Uh, 
That was Commissioner Longer. Elsner was there as well, but on behalf of the TPR, the Front Range TPR, but we need to make that official and have John a voting member if the board's okay with that. All right. Can I, can we ask For a motion to appoint. So moved. Uh, second. Uh, we have a motion and a second <laughs> uh, to appoint John, Las John Lee Asados as an alternate staff Sounds member. Sounds controversial. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. John, you're on the board. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the uh, board, uh, again, uh, Commissioner Elsner was there, so if I miss anything, uh, feel free to uh, fill in the gaps. Uh, but the, it was actually a relatively uh, short uh, stack meeting, and then uh, uh, they actually finished up and uh, canceled some of the other meetings afterwards, so it was a relatively short day. Uh, one of the main items on there was the discussion of the transit development program. Uh, originally, they were going to... Um, have that be an action item, and they were going to talk about uh, how they start reaching out to stakeholders and putting a stakeholder uh, network together. Uh, they, they reconsidered and did not make that an action item and then just sort of was looking for suggestions on uh, different stakeholders uh, for uh, moving forward. They also had a brief discussion about how in the, the way that the uh, development lists are put together with three different things, roadways, transit, and bike and pedestrian, while the, some of the, the uh, ballot measures that are out there, uh, more specifically the 0 0.621, um, has the two of those lists combined, and how, how does that happen, um, and then how does the money then get broken down into the different um, TPRs later on. Again, they're thinking ahead. It has to actually be a problem when, when and if uh, the ballot measure would pass. Uh, so that was a, a, a discussion there. And then uh, we did have a presentation on a, the freight program. Um, if some of you may know, uh, during the uh, uh, MAP uh, 21, they added sort of freight planning as a um, uh, 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 planning item. And then during uh, the FAST Act, they actually started putting some funding towards it. So now there are, so there are some federal funds uh, for freight. And this would uh, talk about how the... Uh, uh, state would allocate those funds, and they did have a list of projects uh, that was discussed. Uh, and with that, Commissioner, if I missed anything, you want to throw anything in there? Yeah, comments. OFF, just don't call me Councilman. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm beginning to understand the priorities here, but. Um, it, would you mind, John, covering the, the Joint Transportation Commission stack meeting? Because I think that was a not only an important conversation, but there are some materials that were used that might be of interest if they haven't already been distributed to the to the board. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, you know, there's nothing more I like than getting caught flat-footed. All right, so uh, I believe the the meeting that you're talking about, Mr. Gunning was at that meeting as well. And this was back in the early part of the um, of July, eighteenth. Yes. yes. And so uh, uh, at that meeting, uh, it was the, uh, the the transportation commission and the stack uh, sort of got in the room. And if I remember correctly, uh, there was discussions about um, how to move forward with the development programs. Um, should money uh, become available, or I think the, the CDOT phrase is, should money fall from the sky? Um, and so uh, there was a discussion about how much is being spent of the, um, the bonding, the funds, and where those came from, and those particular lists, and the understanding that those funds uh, were going to be then uh, bonded with off the top, but then beyond that, the funds... Uh, would still come back to the individual jurisdictions. And I think if at, at that point there was a very lo long discussion about how, I'm going to get the, the acronyms wrong, but the, basically the transit folks in, in the Denver region wanted to submit a project. Is it RTC? Is that the? RTD, I'm sorry. So the RTD wanted to submit a project, and they, there was a long discussion of whether that would be kosher or not, and I believe the answer was no. Uh, at the end of the day. Uh, with that, I'm floundering. Can you remember anything else? No, I think you hit all the highlights. <laughs> yeah, we're, that's our story. We're sticking to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the, the major point there is 
is that it's very difficult for CDOT staff to come up with lists of any kind. The, the, the parameters that go into uh, how you decide what to prioritize, uh, how much, where the money might come from, where it might not, there are so many moving parts, it's extremely difficult. Now, Herman Stockinger, at uh, CDOT staff, who I think you all know, did an outstanding job, in my view, of analyzing all these moving parts and making a proposal, basically. And, and the intent of that conversation was, after some prior discussion about what that looked like, is to get feedback from the stack. Because as, as I think I mentioned before, the commission looks at the stack to validate that this, this staff process is indeed consistent with, with the requirements that are flowing down from the DPCs and the, and, and the COG, so, and the MPL. So um, I thought it was a, an extremely important and critical meeting, and, and its value, at least for me as a commissioner, is independent of what happens this fall. We may end up getting nothing, and there are quite a few people who think that's the case. Um, if that's the case, then, and if we, st if we get smaller amounts of money, we have a process and it is, is sort of an analysis um, uh, algorithm, a set of algorithms that we can apply to decide how to prioritize. For this body, it's important because ultimately the, those funds that do come through CDOT are going to be allocated by that method. And I think we're very well represented now, but I think it's an important strategic meeting. And, and I mentioned briefly, but I think for those of you who are transportation wonks and particularly funding wonks, it might be of interest to you to get a copy of those materials to review. Any other questions? Karen? I have two things that I forgot. I apologize. Um, we are trying to coordinate on the I-25 gap ribbon cutting, hmm. and we're trying to coordinate with the governor's office now. Like with Cimarron, we coordinate with the governor's office, set a date, then he wasn't able to make it. The lieutenant governor wasn't able to make it, and so we do our best. Right now, I think August 30th or September 10th are the dates we're looking at. And if it's August 30th, which I, I think is a stronger date, it's 9 a.m. at the county line on I-25. Um, so I'm Not ribbon sure. cutting, but shovel? Is that Sorry, you? shovel. Yeah, well, groundbreaking. That'd be, lovely. Ribbon ground cutting, that'd be awesome. <laughs> that'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> that'd be kind of magical. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I get them mixed up every and every I say them. Uh, so groundbreaking. Groundbreaking. Yes, the groundbreaking uh, right. August 30th we're looking at. Uh, no, the county line road between Douglas County and El Paso County is where we're looking um, off the interstate. Um, so, again, more to come. I just, again, you, I won't be here um, between, you know, the next meeting September. So I just want to give you a heads up on that date. And then our, our public relations group will be in government relations will be working to reach out and through PPACG too to see who wants to okay. come and then who's going to be speaking at that. Um, but that is an event coming up. So we're, we're pretty excited. The first phase of the I-25 gap will be in um, Douglas County will be the Castle Rock portion because you don't have to buy right away. It's really easy to get done and we've been working with the contractor to put that plan together. We have an agreed upon price and they're ready to move forward. So that's um, extending that three lanes to the south in Castle Rock to Toma Interchange. Um, and then the next phase will be from the south, will be in, in El Paso County, and will go um, up through the Monument Pass, extend that three lane to four lane climbing lane through Monument and come down the other side. And then the third phase will be the middle. That'll be the longer, more complicated one. That's why it's the last one to come out. Um, and so that's that's coming up as a activity, and then uh, there was but the the phasing on Nevada Rock Rim, and a lot of people are asking us too about why are you widening there? Well, we're not necessarily we're widening the interstate in line with what the the environmental assessment had identified as a four lane highway. Again, the middle lane would be an HOV carpool lane. Um, but we're doing that for phasing. So really we're just fixing the bumps through that area and the walls and doing those repairs. But we're widening the interstate for traffic control phasing, but also it'll be then completed for any future widening that we might have in that area. So, um, yeah. Go ahead. 
Yeah. With regard to that, first of all, thanks for doing that. You're talking about the... Uh, you're talking about the uh, I-25 in downtown Colorado Springs area. And uh, been, uh, all of us drive through there quite a lot. I was just curious, has CDOT found any structural problems? You know, those bumps going over those bridges, they were pretty severe. So that indicated to me some pretty intense settling. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have found structural problems underneath, and it's a, perhaps a bigger issue than you originally thought it would be. I haven't heard from my team it's a bigger issue than we originally thought. It's what we examined. Again, we do drilling and we identify things. So the, the settling came from pretty deep, um, like 100 feet down in the clay layer. Now, again, it impacts um, bridge joints and the concrete along there. So um, we're replacing all the bridge joints and we're replacing all the concrete, and we knew we had to do that, and we're filling in underneath that area to make sure it's at grade. We expect another six inches of settlement in the next 10 years, but Ooh. that's one, one reason why when we're done, we'll overlay it with asphalt, and the asphalt will be able to adjust with that six inches of settlement we are, we're still expecting. So against a clay layer down really deep, there are some things with the retaining walls that they, they did have in the plans. Again, it's about a $12 million project, so we do recognize that there are some structural issues or repairs that we have to make in order to make this. Um, let's fix it and let's get it done and let's get it done right, knowing that there still will be um, some settlement in the future. But it, again, it's pretty deep down. In the so again, my way. thanks for doing that. Uh, and I appreciate actually the feedback because, uh, so it's not a surprise to you about what was in there, but a couple of things that you said, uh, that's an indicator to me. It was it's a more substantial repair than kind of what you might see on the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is. It is. Um, and just to let you know, again, some people have said this before, but like on Cimarron, we, we now um, fill up with the earth uh, work, and then we measure that settlement, and we make sure that it gets down to a certain amount of settlement in advance, but also it doesn't have that really deep clay layer. Thanks. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, wanted then to item 7I, Executive Director's Report. Mr. Gunning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two items real briefly. Um, first of all, our office will be closed this Friday, August 10th. Uh, we will be working, but we're going to be doing an off-site staff training, team building event, something I thought was um, important and necessary as we're continuing to build toward uh, becoming and sustaining a high-performing organization. Um, so we'll be out of touch on, on Friday. Um, second item is, as you know, we had a, a state lobbyist this past year for the 2018 legislative session, Lauren Furman. Um, we're at a point where we're trying to figure out what to do for next year, and I think we've gotten some just informal direction um, the months when the legislative committee was meeting that um, really good satisfaction with the services we got from uh, Ms. Furman, um, interest in continu continuing that into 2019, but also possibly interest in having her do some work for us outside of the legislative session, maybe some pre-planning work before we get to the 2019 session so we can identify legislative priorities and, and things of that nature. A lot of work happens outside the regular legislative session. So we reached out to, to Lauren, got a quote for what that would take for 2019 and doing work between now and the 2019 session, um, which would be a $20,000 contract. Uh, when the board first talked about executing a contract uh, for her for this year, that was back in December of last year, and you gave um, – direction to the acting executive director at the time to go forward and um, uh, exercise a, a contract. But I think you also mentioned doing an RFP down the road. We actually did an RFP when we hired her initially for the 2018 work. So we've kind of, we've gone through that process already. Um, and I'm bringing this up now, just looking for direction as to whether or not the board feels comfortable moving forward, giving me the authority to move forward to execute a contract for next year. We can do it without going through an RFP process. Um, and we can really do it without board permission, per se, but I wanted to make sure that I'm consistent with what your, your direction is. If it's underneath a certain threshold, 25. it's okay per our procurement guidelines, $25,000, yeah. right. Um, so we can either bring this back for the September agenda for discussion, action, or if you're okay giving me direction today, we can move forward and execute a contract okay. um, with Lauren to get started. To comments and guidance for the director. Andy? Uh, Andy? I think that worked well last year, and I think the idea of, of picking it up a little bit ahead of time is, is uh, would be what money well spent. I concur and recommend press forward. Yeah, Andy just took the words right out of my mouth. I thought Lauren did a great job. I think everybody agrees she did a great job, and I think we gave her fifteen thousand last year. But with yeah. this added uh, responsibility, the extra five thousand seems. Uh, 
legitimate, and uh, I'm happy to have her representing us. And thanks to Commissioner Waller for that contact. Uh, would, do we have a set a date yet for our legislative uh, agenda setting? Legislative? As much as not all of you have responded, um, yes, it looks like we're going to be doing the morning of Wednesday, October 3rd. Okay. Very good. Uh, uh, Stan? I'll just uh, echo the comments previously made, and I concur as well. And I think Commissioner Waller might have a comment. Yeah, yeah I'd just say thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just say that uh, Lauren's a bargain at twenty grand. Uh, I think that's uh, she's one of the best in the biz. Okay. Any question? That's pretty clear. I think you have your guidance. Yeah. Anything else, Eddie? No. Okay, very good. Uh, last item then is a member entity announcement. Go quickly around the horde. Mayor Lady, want to start us off? I uh, can't think of anything great. We finished uh, an eight and a half million dollar um, wastewater treatment uh, improvement yesterday, so that's uh, that's the big news from Woodland Park. Yeah, just uh, we've talked a little bit about um, some of the flooding issues, and we did have also a county bridge that got washed out. Uh, and we're working towards a more permanent repair with concrete culverts instead of just replacing uh, the steel uh, circular culvert that was in there. Unfortunately, that will be a four to six week repair. Uh, it is an emergency repair for us as well. It was briefed to the Board of County Commissioners this morning. It's in the southeast part of El Paso County and it's over a million dollars uh, for that effort as well. So we've got um, a similar problem that you know, CDOT has one that you briefed a little bit earlier today and we've got one in the county as well but we're gonna get it fixed under emergency conditions and so our apologies to the residents that live down there because the alternative route is depending on where you live up to a 14 mile uh, deviation yeah so it's a it was a critical road that got washed out that we've got to fix so we're working on under emergency thank you Um, oh, gosh. Is that, are you talking about Old Pueblo Road? Yes. So are we going to work with the state patrol so that when Highway I-25 gets shut down like it did a couple of times last weekend, they're not um, directing people onto Old Pueblo Road so they have to turn around in, in that road? Uh, that's a good question, and we can just relay that uh, to Jim Reed, our uh, Department of Public Works Director. He, uh, in our conversation with him this morning, we were asking him to uh, do a, uh, uh, yesterday morning, excuse me, uh, do a better placement on some signs uh, so that people that, you know, they don't necessarily drive all the way down to uh, where the washout is and then have to turn around. So basically moving the signs back up and going to the detail. Now, if 25 closes, I don't know what's going to happen under those conditions, but they can't go over to Old Pueblo Road, they won't be able to get yeah, through. Yeah, because there's a lot of people who are used to doing that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so we need to make sure they're not getting up there and getting stacked up. We'll uh, be happy to relay that to Jim Reed. He may have already addressed that. I just don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Oh, oh and Jennifer's here. I bet she can answer that. Jennifer Irvin, El Paso County. Uh, we are working today on getting better and updated signage, and I've uh, been in contact with Captain Lupton, who is this region's... Um, uh, kind of overseer of all state patrol uh, he's a good friend of mine so uh, and we are coordinating with that uh, directly so uh, and and also we also had an additional press release out yesterday which also included the um, the detour route um, that we have for that um, but we'll we'll make sure that we get out as much information as possible yeah. we've also put out um, just information on Twitter on Facebook etc from uh, showing the detour routes as well and if you have anything else that comes up, please let us know. You can send it to Jim or I. Thank you. No, no real updates. I, I do want to thank CDOT. Uh, 285 is open. Our fire is mostly out. Uh, you know, those fires never go out until you get a good snowstorm. But for their help um, during the fire, redirecting traffic to make sure everything would flow through and then of course a week when the fire started uh, dying down their quick response to replace the bridge or the culvert that was washed out uh, because we had some really good rain on top of the fire. 
City of Fountain is about hatter with the hail this year. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Ah, oh, hail. I'm tired of hearing that. Yeah, I, we, we got slammed the third time. Uh, and then uh, the second storm, we had residents who got hit from above, and then their basements flooded in the second storm. And uh, so now then we got hit again uh, this week, so people got new cars. I don't know what they're going to do again. To get a new car again? I don't know. I don't know how that works. Uh, it's, it's, if, you hear, if you see people driving around with a really bad windshield, you know, just be patient. Uh, the police station, uh, police once again, again, everybody till the end of September, uh, as long as it's not in driver's line of vision. So, yeah, it, it's 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 tough down there. You know, people are really tired. And then we got we got several residents who also owned uh, property down in uh, La Vida Way who lost homes down there, and then their homes up here are damaged. So, so be patient with us, but we're getting there. And just a quick comment on that uh, from Commissioner Van Wert here. So uh, also on the west side, several people got hit pretty bad. We all know about the zoo, and a lot of the residents around there were severely damaged. And for me personally, I probably have two cars that got totaled out. Uh, we're still waiting for the insurance to deal with that. And we had damage on the house, but just about every neighbor in my neighborhood had uh, severe roof damage. So that was one nasty hailstorm. Yeah, we have citizens who just got their new roof, and now they need another roof. So um, there was a lady at the PFOS PFOA EP meeting last night. Had a big bandage around her head. She was uh, got a skull fracture from it. Uh, got hit on the head with the hail. I mean, you just it was it was coming down so hard it was bouncing 15, 20 feet up in the air when it would hit the hit something. So it's pretty amazing. All right. Anybody else at the table? All right. Thank you very much. We're. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So uh, if you uh, were coming all the Turner, way around, and Turner yeah. and then Mayor. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank all the uh, new uh, people from the uh, various uh, services that are here today. Thank you for your service and uh, keeping us safe. Really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, I uh, like to give a uh, positive uh, report from the town of Rama. I'd like to thank. Uh, uh, El Paso County, they came out and uh, 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 chip sealed all the uh, roads in uh, Rama. Uh, we used uh, our uh, PPRTA funds to uh, pay for that, and uh, so uh, that's uh, a big project for a little town like uh, Rama, and uh, we're uh, getting that uh, done just in time for Rama Days. Uh, Rama Days will be on uh, Saturday, and it's a fun time. The local church uh, puts on uh, breakfast for a uh, donation, and then the uh, uh, legion uh, serves uh, uh, lunch, just uh, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs and that kind of fare. Uh, but there's uh, free bouncy houses for the kids, and then there's little games they can play. Their nominal cost and uh, things like this, and uh, but. Uh, the tractor pull starts at noon. Uh, old tractors, I think the oldest ones are like 37s, 1937s. They go up, I think, uh, I think 1953s are the newest, but they put various amounts of weights on them so they can run the same tractors in various weight classes. And, and uh, you know, uh, you can drive it, and uh, then uh, you'll get off, and I'll drive the same tractor, so we'll, we'll, we'll see who can operate it better and uh, <laughs> things like that. And, uh, have a lot of fun, and, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a pretty good time, and uh, uh, but uh, we we have a, a good time out there in our, our little community. It, it actually started off uh, 18 years ago as an ice cream social. So, uh, but uh, we uh, we have a band in the evening uh, to dance to, and uh, when the band's on break, they have a DJ playing songs. So uh, it's uh, and that's all free. Uh, the dance at night and stuff. So it's a, a good time. And then the uh, <clears throat> town uh, has a pulled pork sandwich and beans and potato salad and okay. I don't know, oh corn on the cob and I think all that's five dollars and it's a pretty good size sandwich. So it's a pretty reasonable meal for five dollars I think. Okay. Very good. I think you get a glass of lemonade or something with it too. So you know it's it's not too expensive. Got it. You know. All right. Thank you. Yeah. It's All pretty right. it's pretty good time if you want to come out to Rima. Very good. Ken. 
Um, just a couple quick things. Um, unfortunately, I did have to sign my first emergency declaration uh, after the storm on the 23rd. I hope to not have to do that again. Uh, but uh, specifically wanted to thank El Paso County and Colorado Springs for mutual aid response. It was huge for us to get us up and running. And also thank Karen uh, and CDOT for the effort of getting out there immediately on Manitou Avenue. Pretty devastating for us when our main thoroughfare through town is closed down. Um, the good news is it's pretty easy to get from east to west in Manitou Springs. It's a little more challenging to get from west to east. But uh, we do have detours posted and... Um, we're trying to make it aware, make people aware that you can get through town or at least come in the east end and, and uh, get, get to our downtown. Um, on a happier note, uh, I don't know if we'll top the REMA event, but on August 19th, we are closing Manitou Avenue intentionally uh, for a street party in connection with the uh, Pikes Peak Marathon. So this year, we are part of an international running series, the Solomon Series, um, all over the globe. And the Pikes Peak Marathon was selected to be one of the five races. So we are having a street party. Uh, the road, road will be closed down all day. Um, so if you're coming to Manitou, plan on parking. We will have outlying parking and shuttles bringing you in. Uh, but we'll have a uh, full complement of food, beer, entertainment, as well as the runners uh, coming into town um, that day. So just wanted to invite you to that party as well. Mm. well. We'll go out to Raymond and enjoy yours if you all come out to Manitou Springs as well. Councilmember <laughs> Mavila, anything? No. Okay. Dur. Uh, Ty yeah. Tyler. Tyler. <laughs> Tyler. <laughs> With apologies, Norm, I, I am going to mention food because uh, at the Manitou uh, Street Breakfast, we'll also be uh, the fire department in Green Mountain Falls will be serving pancakes as well for them. So apologies to that. But uh, back to the hail damage, Green Mountain Falls as well suffered uh, through a couple storms and our public works department has been uh, working to restore roads and culverts and such, and it's been uh, a nonstop effort. But again, I want to thank uh, El Paso County as well as CDOT for their support um, and help for our little hamlet as we're trying to recover. It's a significant event for our little town, and it's a question as these uh, FEMA discussions come about what's regular maintenance versus what's uh, an emergency and uh, when our little modest budget is exceeded it quickly becomes an emergency for a small town which is uh, interesting okay uh, that concludes our meeting today thank you everyone for coming the next meeting is oh I'm sorry Terry <laughs> pardon me I just wanted to mention that the Health Care Council is an ongoing uh, important uh, part of this community and uh, Councilman Pico and uh, uh, Commissioner Vanderwerth attend those meetings and we're looking forward at the next meeting to Andy uh, coming to uh, brief uh, about the PPACG to the Military Affairs Council and I know he's done a great job of going around to all the communities but yeah. he's continued to step out awesome okay okay our next meeting is on September 12th that's 1103 we're adjourned I just wanted to give everybody a flash news update. I guess apparently a traffic accident caused by weather on Highway 24 in both directions, east, just uh, out in Callahan. So, anyways. Mm -hmm. Stay and have lunch.